E93 series, Maserati Ghibli, Mercedes SL. What do they all have in common? They drop value quicker than Intel-powered MacBooks. Depreciation is single-handedly the most powerful market-shifting tool in the used car market. On one hand, depreciation can give you a serious discount on a high-end luxury car. And on the other, well, it can cause you to lose your ass. If you want to learn the ideal way to scout for the good ones, make sure you check out the ideal car strategies to make sure you don't get hosed. Now sit back, relax, and let's go over some of the best cheap luxury cars that are the worst to own. Let's get into it. We're kicking things off with a twin-turbo V12-powered supercar slayer in geriatric clothing. Couple that with a massive original price tag that started deep into six figures, now being sold for less than 10 grand, and you have a very lucrative proposition for car enthusiasts. But I don't think most people really know what they're getting into with this one. Nothing is normal about these cars. The suspension? A fully dynamic, adjustable, rodeoable, high-pressure hydraulic system. And if and when it fails, and it will, it's an expensive and complicated diagnosis, often ending in a bill that exceeds the worth of the car, especially if you have to replace any of the hard lines. The fully automatic hardtop convertible? Also hydraulically operated with eight individual cylinders that tend to spring leaks, leaks that can send hydraulic fluid running across your Alcantara headliner, or even worse, right into your lap. Now, if you thought it couldn't get any more complicated for seemingly no other reason than to beat the Guinness world record for most expensive weird tech on a luxury car, we have the brake by wire system. That's right, electronic braking. A system that legitimately has a finite amount of braking actuations before you need to replace it, to the tune of $1,200, for a remanufactured unit if you install it yourself. But you can't install it yourself because you need the Mercedes diagnostic system to do anything on this car. Coil packs are another common problem, but find yourself with the Biturbo V12, and there are 24 spark plugs, and 24 coils. 24. But don't worry, Mercedes went ahead and conjoined all 12 on each cylinder bank into one giant single piece coil. That way you can test individual coils for failure and then still have to spend thousands of dollars and change them all at once anyway. It's long been known that the N54 powered BMW 3 Series is the best bang for buck modern tuner car when it comes to making gobs of power. As soon as you experience the near Tesla levels of acceleration from a well-tuned 335, you'll be hitting up every used car website to price out your next twin turbo project. While you sit there and giggle astonished at how much tire boiling fun you can have for not a lot of money, if you don't buy the right car, well, you'll probably find yourself in a classic BMW situation. Because the same things that make the car so great are also the core reason for their inevitable downfall. With a turbocharged engine and very strong internals, these cars make great power as standard and can be taken to near supercar levels without a ton of modifications. However, that also means everything associated has to be over-engineered and complicated to handle that kind of power and potential abuse. Just for the fuel system alone, we're talking a complicated multi-pump high-pressure direct injection setup that's known for both low and high-pressure pump failure, as well as the injectors dying themselves. All very big ticket items directly responsible for the health of your engine. Running too lean and doing a full boost pull is a great way to send the insides of your engine straight into space. Direct injection also means you need to have your intake valves cleaned every 30,000 miles or so due to carbon buildup. Factory turbocharger failure is more common than not. Oil filter housings and oil cooler gaskets commonly fail. Valve covers seem to love to leak right onto the exhaust manifold. Complete cooling system failure, including the pricey electric water pump, and don't even get me started on those sticky, disgusting interior door handles. What even is that? Just no. If you're not a certified mechanic or don't have the drive to learn how to become one, your best bet is to stay away from the 335i twin turbo BMW altogether. When it comes to VAG, no one did crazy experiments and then never talked about them quite like Volkswagen. I mean, come on. They built a freaking W12 powered supercar and I bet none of you even know what it looks like. 
Somewhere along the line, execs over at VAG decided they wanted a Volkswagen to be the best luxury car in the world. So what did they do? They used the Bentley D1 platform that carried the Continental GT as the basis for their new ultra-luxury Volkswagen sedan. Utilizing tech like continuously adjustable air suspension, adaptive cruise control over 20 years ago, and even a system that reads road signs to implement speed warnings and such into your GPS system. And 20 years ago, it certainly was one of the best luxury cars on the road. But these days, it's more like a self-imposed booby trap. Electrical gremlins can be found throughout the entire car. The W12s and even the W8s have problems on their own with discontinued parts, and if you thought this might be a good place to start your DIY journey, the Bentley DNA under the skin of this beast has dictated any factory information to be as classified as secret government documents. While there are certainly a couple good ones out there somewhere, most of these are unfortunately just not ideal. Do yourself a favor and just get an Audi A8 instead. Ah yes, yet another BMW on this list. But instead of the usual common suspects from the more entry level models, there was one particular 7 series generation that people consistently get hosed on. The E65 745 was a technical marvel of its time, both in how advanced it was and how nobody could figure out how a car this ugly could ever leave the factory. Nonetheless, once you step inside, you're gonna forget all about its terrible looks when you're immediately punched in the face by endless repair bills. The E65 7 Series was nothing short of a secret disaster. The electronic systems were so overbearing that they needed a high output alternator just to supply enough power to the battery. But that created too much heat, and so they actually used a water-cooled friggin' alternator that, of course, never leaked. And guess where that was? near the bottom of the engine, right where you can't get to it. Relentless transmission failures constantly left these cars stranded, and with one of the worst BMW engines of all time, this one ended up with the short end of the stick on all four corners. It truly is a shame. Normally this is where we'd tell you to make an educated decision, but I think we might go ahead and call this a no-go altogether. This fire-breathing, six-speed shifting, Recaro-seated friggin' sedan is powered by quite possibly one of the best-sounding V8s to ever come out of Germany, maybe even the world. And by golly, as soon as you hear one, you're gonna be instantly infatuated and searching for one of your own. I can hear your weird little evil laughs as you see how friggin' cheap these things are, and for a manual V8 all-wheel drive overachiever, it seems like a complete crime not to pick one up. But the real crime lies behind the lifetime engineering oversight on the glorious sounding engine. You see, the timing chain components used on this engine were supposed to last beyond the lifetime of the whole car by utilizing a timing chain system rather than a belt. As such, Audi put the entire timing system then on the back of the engine. Sounds cool, didn't work. Turns out the plastic chain guides like to get brittle and turn into dust, sending chunks of plastic through the oil passages and causing timing to jump. A catastrophic engine failure. This means that replacing the timing components is now pretty much a major engine safety concern and extremely labor intensive. You see, with the timing on the back of the engine, the transmission has to come out to do the service. And if the trans is coming off, you better do the clutch while it's out, and so on and so forth. This makes for one massive repair bill just for the peace of mind that it won't spontaneously combust, and the main contributor to why these cars are so temptingly cheap. When Maserati announced it was bringing back the Ghibli in 2013, its knockout gorgeous looks and drop dead aggressive sound had everyone falling head over heels in love. Enthusiasts of fine Italian automobiles lined up with checkbooks at the ready. The Ghibli was an instant hit, but it wouldn't take long before people started feeling a bit of buyer's remorse. With lackluster performance, recycled Chrysler parts on the interior, and overall terrible ownership experience with more time spent in the shop than on the road. The Ghibli would quickly earn itself a reputation for having a lot more bite than it has bark, based on how it would attack your savings account shortly after purchase. Once again, we're looking at some electrical gremlins, but with the Maserati stuff, it seems to be endless cases of random things not working at random times. Owners often experience intermittent radio issues, with the dealer solution being to turn it off and turn it back on again. 
window regulator failures are more common than a Miata at an autocross event. And don't even get me started on the quality control issues found throughout the interior and all over the whole car. The Ghibli will go down in history as one of the great Italian automobiles that you should only experience through touring. Ah yes, the underdog not car company that made the quickest accelerating vehicle on the friggin' planet with the Tesla Model S. From the bonkers performance to the endless convenience an electric car can offer, the Tesla Model S is an easy sell for most people, and a seemingly no-brainer idea at a reasonable price on the used car market. But let me tell you, there are a couple major reasons you should question the price. Now, on paper, an electric car makes total sense as a commuter, but when you start to put together issues that come with owning an older Model S, could pit you in the same boat as an old Mercedes S-Class, well, while not having a prehistoric fuel exploding inside a metal box rids these cars of a lot of basic maintenance, there is still plenty to go wrong. The battery packs are water-cooled, just like an engine, with pumps, hoses, radiators, and they're all known to leak over time. And if the system thinks it has a failure, or doesn't believe it's at optimum temperature, it may not even let you charge the dang thing. Door handle failure will have you reaching across the cabin to let your friends in from the inside like it's a high school sh box. But maybe worst of all is the lackluster build quality. Electric cars are damn near silent, amplifying squeaks and rattles, of which there are many, and it will drive you mad. But the quality control issues don't stop at fit and finish. The Model S also features a great riding air suspension when it functions. But with a high failure rate at only 50,000 miles, this is a very expensive premature failure that can not only leave you stranded, but cost you thousands. These kinds of issues are found all over these cars. Please use caution and buy an ideal example. Back in the late 90s, Land Rover designed one of the most elegant, aggressive, and downright baller looking luxury SUVs of all time. And by 2002, or 2003 here in the US, when it launched to the public, every celebrity and rap music video featured the new Range Rover. It was and still is a pop culture icon, especially when you see how little it costs to buy one of these now 20 years on for yourself. However, for this game-changing new Range Rover, the weirdos back in the cubicles weren't listening to the engineers when they decided to partner up with BMW, utilizing their 4.4 liter M62 V8 and largely basing their electrical architecture on the E39 5 Series. Or maybe it was because BMW owned Land Rover at the time, but I digress. While the luxury automaker matchup seemed like a match made in heaven on paper, the electric gremlins and complicated drivetrain architecture proved to be very expensive to keep on the road. If the plethora of drivetrain malfunctions haven't had you puking in your mouth just yet, how about the endless air suspension issues? Leaking airbags will overrun the compressor, and then when the pump fails, you're literally stranded. The L322 Range Rover is quite possibly the closest you can get to G-Wagon presence on a budget. But if you don't shop for the ideal example, this could be one of the worst financial decisions you've ever made. The BMW partnership proved troublesome pretty quickly. And just a few years later in 2006, switching to a Jaguar drivetrain and a ZF six-speed transmission, things definitely started looking up. But the ones you really want are the 2013 and up five liter with the ZF8 speed. While this is a Jaguar sourced unit, it's largely based on Ford's Coyote engine, using a literal Ford block and all. So if you need an L322 Range Rover in your life, just like we do, it's definitely worth the extra money to step up to a later model with that five liter engine, especially in supercharged form. Porsche Cayenne, the do it all whenever and wherever you want SUV developed by a legendary sports car maker. What could possibly go wrong? While the practicality of an SUV with the attributes of a sports car might sound like a good time, and really it is, the sports car inspired performance comes with some supercar maintenance costs, and the same big design flaw as the PT Cruiser. 
With a clamshell inspired front end, the fenders wrap around the engine, greeting in a triangle shaped area to service the vehicle, just like the PT Cruiser or water cooled VW Beetle, making it incredibly difficult to work on. This increases repair costs dramatically at the shop due to inflated labor costs. Not cool. And much like its cousins, the Audi Q7 and VW Touareg, these bad boys are cooling system nightmares. From plastic components breaking causing leaks in the worst places, to the water pump gasket failing and prompting thousands of dollars in repairs, especially in the V8 equipped models. Now look, we like seeing another Cayenne on the road as much as the next guy. Heck, I almost have more respect for the old ones knowing what someone's willing to sacrifice to keep it on the road. And they are insanely capable in the rough stuff. But these are not for normal people. While it may not be a 911, it is 100% Porsche. So expect to fork over your wallet as such. Possibly one of the most beautiful automotive designs of the last century, the Alfa Romeo Giulia is an attractive purchase for a ton of different reasons. But buyers should beware that Italian engineering has a reason for its bad reputation. Behind these gorgeous hips, beautiful eyes, and soft, subtle interior is real, genuine Italian craftsmanship. These cars are truly riddled with Italian meatball problems, which is part of the charm, but makes them just a bit too much of a hassle to own one. While electrical issues are to be expected, these things went wild trying to sabotage their owners. Endless misfires lead to overheated catalytic converters, which results in melted bits of wiring harness, neither cheap repairs. And when combined, it can become catastrophically expensive. Worst of all are the multiple issues directly related to braking components. From breaking brake hoses, loss of ABS, fractured brake discs, and if the braking system wasn't enough, you get leaking fuel hoses that cause fires. The Alfa Romeo Giulia is possibly one of the most beautiful modern luxury vehicles that you should never own. That being said, I'd give both my lungs for a Giulia Quad though. So, while these cars might seem like a great bargain on paper, and otherwise a great automotive experience, these here will take you for every last dime you have with little to zero warning. What do you guys think? Have any of you ever owned one of these? What was your experience like? What are some cars we missed? Let me know down in the comments below. Go check out some more Ideal content right over here. This is Trav, this has been Ideal, and I'll see you all very soon.